Guido, can you hear us? Good. Okay, I'm good. Not. Good. Um, I know uh, Martin is, um, he had uh, problems with his job. It turned out that they weren't paying overtime and they were doing all sorts of stuff. Um, so he doesn't have that problem anymore, but he's got Withy connections. And he said he was going to try and run up a hill and borrow a friend's computer and see if he can get with the connection on campus where he is. Um, so he may be joining us. I've got it all set up for him on, but I haven't heard from her. Um, so how, how is it going? How is the inner work? I'm going to start with you, Ian. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've, been <clears throat> I've been doing more of it. Um, not as regularly as I would like, but I'm, I'm working towards that. Um, Yesterday, I had a really kind of, uh, how do I, I had a really intense interaction with the, with the, the finger and toe bone exercise. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was doing it again in the morning, and I, I, would, I was trying to run through it three times in a row, um, and I would get to the end <laughs> of the right foot, and all of a sudden, I would be somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and so I'd start over, you know, I was like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this. Um, and it was really interesting to try and hold my attention on the exercise, but then also hold my attention kind of a little more high, high above it. So I could also, I could try and watch for when the distractions would come in um, and not you know, not get moved by them, not get taken up by them. Um, and and it, it got more and more frustrating. And then I think, I don't know, my, my guess is maybe something in the emotional center kicked in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was, I was able to do, because I, I, I couldn't get through the first round repeatedly. And then finally I was like, no, this is going to happen. And I got through all three <laughs> really easily, like, relatively easily. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting to watch my, my center of attention or my center of focus get taken over by, by, you know, something, whatever it was, thoughts about the day or maybe some sort of dream, something, cause it was very early. So my mind was still very, um, I don't know, more, more liquid, I guess. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, my problem is not not doing it i have a tendency to go from the left foot to the left hand and it's i forgot my right foot and then i have to go back and do it all again um, so i can do it sequentially but somehow i guess my left and left it just seems more comfortable to come up and then it's like no i've got to go around in a circle mm -hmm. um, yeah there was one time where I, was, I went back and forth between the feet for a while just because i wasn't i wasn't tracking it yeah um, I, I should also say Michael has uh, his job. They've got him starting an hour earlier. So rather than starting at 6 a.m., um, he's starting at 5 a.m. I was talking to him yesterday. So I don't expect him to uh, – I expect him to be fast asleep now um, because it's he's got to get up in like four hours oh um, to, to get to work. Uh, being in uh, Perth in Australia, way on the other side of the world um, – and I, I'm gonna. I may see if I can find a few more people to sort of pump up our numbers, but I don't really care because this is really good. We can ask him that questions, and we can go a little bit more into it. Um, so your so your 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 sort of dry spell is kind of ending, then Ian. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Kind of problems, you know, just uh, you know, all these worries and these things just sort of crowding in on you, and they've begun to lift and. I think so. Yeah. Just, I mean, something, something drained the batteries. Yeah. So, but they seem to be filling back up. Okay. Guido yourself, how are things? I mean, we just talked last night. So, um, how are you today? Um, the concoction of, uh, the work with the, all the, the, with all the things that are happening with me, I, uh, in a good way, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm really uh, very serious about the, the 
to, 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 to these attachments that can be put together in order to uh, distantiate and at the same time uh, grab so I can uh, do some work. I, I, <clears throat> the, um, the, six, the 60 bond exercise is so great, you know. Yeah. Every time I do it, it, it gives me some kind of release. Yeah. I, I relieve. Uh, so I, I'm keeping going on. Whether if I can do it or not, it's not the que it's not the, a yeah. question. But uh, I I try, you know. I'm I'm trying. How how was the pain today? Um. Uh, I, I'm 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 taking some uh, liquid that is kind of morphine. It's, it's no morphine. It's, it's, it's name is tramadol. Tramadol is tramadol, kind yeah. of. A, yeah. Anesthetic, you know, <clears throat> so I can, I can, I can have control of my pain, uh, and I write down every time I take in the drops. You know, sometimes I draw ten, fifteen, but but that's the way I can uh, hold the pain a little, a lot, a lot. Sometimes a lot. I'm okay now. You're okay now. Yeah. Uh I mean, when we talked yesterday at the beginning, you were nine out of ten on the pain scale, which is uh, quite extreme. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, Sometimes you know it's very difficult to hold the pain, to you know to to um, resist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I should say as well, um, Michael uh, from Perth, uh, he gave it to me a while ago and then it just slipped my mind. Um, uh, a 25 minute recording of George Addy's preparation exercise. And I finally listened to it last night and wonderful exercise. I'm going to transcribe it. Uh, clean it up a bit and perhaps re-record it. I don't know. Worry, I, you know, I don't want to get into copyright violation stuff. So there's a way of just sort of massaging it slightly, so I don't have to worry about that. But uh, in terms of the breathing and stuff, um, you know, he he adds another level of dimension to this aspect of conscious breathing. Um, you know, breathing and feeling the energy, the active element coming down into your stomach and feeling another force coming up from your navel to meet it and other things. I thought it was a wonderful exercise and kicking myself why I didn't listen to it six weeks ago. And I know Michael has a few more. I'm going to try and get him to send it to me and uh, again, massage them and clean them up a bit and re-record them uh, to make them available. But one of the things he did stress on that exercise was the importance of becoming aware of our toes, and particularly our toes separately. I mean, it's only like a 10-second part of a 26-minute recording, but you know, it's something that we have to really work on. And I remember when I was in the Gurdjieff Bennett group, um, the leader of the group said that uh, uh, Bennett would say, you know, do you want your people? Well, do I really have to sense all my toes separately? And Bennett would say to them, well, do you want your whole body to coalesce into a Kesjian body or do you just want part of it? Um, and basically, he was saying, for some reason, it's very important to learn to distinguish each toe. And I know that for myself, the hardest ones that I had to learn to distinguish were between the um, middle and fourth toe. Uh, the baby toe I can do, the second toe I could do, the big toe I could do. I could even sort of do the middle toe, but when I went to the fourth toe, the middle toe and the fourth toe have some kind of uh, um, connection so that, you know, when you move one, the other gets moved. And so doing the 60 bone exercise, working through the hands and the feet and all of that is very important. Um, so let's just... Do an inner exercise at the start right now. 
let's just become aware of our body in whatever way we can. To become aware of our arms, our legs, our hands, our feet. To become aware of our torso, our neck, our head. To just, in whatever way we can, begin to develop some kind of internal sensation, internal awareness of our body. Now we can break the sensory nerve nodes that we have in our brain down into a diff couple of different categories. We have this ability to sense the effect of gravity on our body. So become aware of the effect of gravity on your body, how gravity is pulling your body down. Perhaps become aware of the pressure points underneath your buttocks, underneath your thighs, the bottom of your feet. Become aware, as best you can, of the sensation of gravity. We also have special sensory nerve nodes within our brain devoted to the sense of balance. So become aware of this internal sense of balance, how your head is balanced on your neck, your neck is balanced on your shoulders, your shoulders is balanced on your spine, your spine is balanced on your pelvic bones. If you're standing up, how your pelvic bones are balanced on your legs. Become aware of this internal sensation of balance. And this one is actually an interesting one to play with because if you put yourself out of balance, and Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, for people who do have problems with self-sensing, to take poses that are slightly awkward, poses that may bring a little bit of pain that are not harmful to you. So to just hold yourself in an unnatural position will help you to build up the sensation of the body. Maybe, you know, I've got my leg lifted up right now. Uh, I've got my other leg lifted up just to do little things that are not normal, to get out of your normal comfort position because we've got habitual postures, habitual ways of sitting, habitual ways of walking, standing. And if we begin to alter them, if we begin to alter the habitual patterns, we can get a, a, a different sense within ourself and a, a greater clarity of the sensation of self. You know, as I've said and repeated in many videos, this is the, the first most important step. And it's a foundational step, this awareness of our body this development of the sensation of self, as I've talked about in many other videos. So we also have special sensory nerve nodes that can tell us about the temperature of our body. So we can be aware of, you know, if we're a little too hot or if we're a little too cold. Uh, if we're too hot, um, the uh, hypothalamus, the, the, the master regulator gland in the very center of our head uh, will begin to cause us to sweat. If we're a little too cold, it will cause goosebumps. Uh, this normally occurs at a very mechanical level where we're not aware of it. But we can become aware of the temperature. We can become aware of the temperature of our body, the temperature of the air that touches our skin. We can also become aware of things in our body like our spine, we can become aware of bones in our body. Um, another thing we can become aware of is the atmospheric pressure surrounding our body. Um, I've talked about before that people who live in mountains and go up and down mountains have a much greater awareness of the atmospheric pressure. Whereas those of us who live in a very sort of uh, flat place or we, there's not a lot of height in terms of where we live going up and down, we can still become aware of atmospheric pressure, but this is, it becomes a little bit harder, but we can become aware of it during storms, for instance. Um, you know, the barometric air pressure goes up when it begins to rain and it goes down when the blue skies come out. Um, so we can become aware of the pressure of the air around us. Um, then we can become aware of certain things inside our body. Um, we have specific nerve nodes, for instance, down our esophagus. So we can become aware if food gets stuck, which could be very dangerous. 
Uh, we've got sensory nerve nodes of where our esophagus, where the whole um, food going into the stomach and air going into the lung separates because we don't want to aspirate, for instance, to drink something and swallow it into our lungs and we end up coughing or to perhaps have a little bit of food go down there. So we can become very aware of that. Um, we also, you know, have these, these, these nerve nodes inside our lungs. Um, so we can become aware of our lungs, especially inflating and deflating. And then we have, you know, nerve nodes, uh, special ones inside our stomach, so that, uh, you know, if we're feeling sick, if we're feeling nauseous, if we have too much gas in our stomach, if we ate something that's incompatible with us or whatever, we can become aware of it. And then um, we also have them in our bladder. So if we have to go pee, go to the toilet, in our colon, if we have to go to the toilet, um, we can sense that. So we've got these internal sensory nerve nodes in our body, but they, they also extend um, throughout our body. Uh, we've got them in our bones. Um, we've got them in our tendons, our ligaments, so that we can determine, you know, if we've hurt ourselves, uh, if something's wrong within our body. One of the few places that we do not have them is actually in our brain. So surgeons and doctors have found if they can cut open the skull and get into the brain, the pain is in the skull, it's in the skin, it's cutting through, but once you get into the brain, there is no pain because we don't have those sensory nerve nodes in the brain that can allow us to feel pain, but we do have them throughout our body. So just try to get a sense of your body sitting there. Try to get this awareness of your body. And Mr. Gurdjieff said it's good to build this awareness up from the bottom of the feet all the way up to the top of the head. So let's do Mr. Gurdjieff's uh, uh, filling exercise. As a vessel fills with warm golden honey, just imagine filling with sensation in the body. And let's just start imagining filling with sensation in our feet. So become aware of our feet, sensing our feet, and then imagine the sensation and rising up to our ankles and then imagine it rising up to our knees filling with sensation up to our hips and our hands filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet up to our elbows and midriff filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet up through our torso up through our arms up to our shoulders and then filling with sensation right up to our neck and filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet up to the top of our neck and then filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet all the way up to the top of our head. Sensing our whole body. And I have to say that a few years ago, a few years ago, 15 years ago, when I learned about this exercise, I found it very difficult to do, to maintain the sensation in the lower parts as it rises, but the more I've practiced it, the easier it becomes. So this is an exercise that the more we do it, the easier it becomes, and it's a foundational exercise. There's a, a, an importance of becoming aware of our physical body. Um, we should become aware and learn to become aware of our physical body with such mastery that we can hold this awareness in the back of our consciousness. We can never mechanically become mindful of our body, and this is an act of mindfulness. All acts of mindfulness require intent. They require conscious intent. They require a higher energy. So we have to learn to hold it in the back of our awareness uh, so that we can begin to become aware of other things. I will explain this later. This is something I intend to talk about today. So as you're listening, maintain this awareness of your body as best as you can. Sense your body from the bottom of your feet all the way to the top of your head. 
sense gravity, balance, temperature, atmospheric pressure, sense your esophagus, your stomach, your lungs inflating, deflating, uh, the internal perceptions of your bladder, perhaps your colon. Really try to inhabit your body, to sense your body as fully as you can. And then become aware of your breathing. Become aware of the air that flows in through your nostrils, past the bridge of your nose, back of your mouth, throat, down into your lungs. Become aware of your lungs inflating. And then as you breathe out, trace the journey past all those points again, aware of your lungs deflating. And when I was in the Gurdjieff Bennett group, um, they highlighted the importance of becoming aware of the air flowing past the bridge of your nose. Um, part of the air that flows in actually feeds us through the bridge of our nose. Part of it, most of it, feeds us in the lungs. But as, any, as anyone who has done illicit drugs, who've snorted drugs up their nose or whatever, know, um, there's a very thin barrier between the membranes of the nose and up in the brain. So as we breathe in, this is why it's good to breathe in through the nose, and we can breathe out through the mouth if we want to, but breathing in through the nose brings that air up to the bridge of our nose, and it also pulls the air down into our lungs. And these are both important awarenesses. So just become aware of yourself breathing, tracing the flow of air in and back out again, aware of the inflation and deflation, the expansion and contraction of the lungs, and perhaps even become aware of the movement of the various muscles involved, primarily the diaphragm, as it moves down the diaphragmic cavity, causing the lungs to open, and then as it comes back up the diaphragmic cavity, causing the lungs to push the air out. And make sure you take nice, deep, abdominal breaths. One of the things, if you go online and look at different breathing techniques and way to breathe, and for people who suffer from anxiety, they always focus on the in-breath and taking nice, deep, abdominal breaths in. But what they forget to mention is as night follows day, as up and down and right and left, you know, the polarities, the out-breath is as important as the in-breath. We feed ourselves with oxygen and higher molecules, particularly when we become conscious of our breathing. We breathe in higher molecules. And as I've talked about in different uh, 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 talks, different parts of the series, the conscious breathing involves a lot more. But just right now, the conscious awareness of breathing in actually allows us to inhale some of these higher particles that are in the air, and as we breathe out, we're actually exhaling a lot of waste products. And scientists have done a lot of studies on breath and hooked people up to things so that they can't breathe in a way that it's not measured, and that they found approximately 70%, 70, 70% 70 of our waste products are exhaled. So not only is it important to feed our body, but it's also important to cleanse our body. Mr. Gurdjieff talked about the fact that we have three being foods. We have the food that we eat in our mouth, we have the air that we breathe, and we have the impressions we receive through our eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds. And he also said that because these are three different foods, that there are waste products that need to be properly eliminated. I'm not going to go into this right now, but he talks about how the waste products of our impressions build up in our sexual organisms, which means that the sexual act can be a very cathartic cleansing act of the body. But breathing out is also very important. 
So taking nice, deep abdominal breaths, breathing in, bringing the food in, and then breathing out properly. I have studied dialectical behavior therapy. I work with it with some of my clients. And they have a breathing exercise for people who suffer from anxiety. And for them, the breathing exercise is you breathe in for a count of four, and then you breathe out for a count of eight. And that makes sure that all of the toxins, all of the carbon dioxide, all of the poisonous gases, all of the things that we eliminate through our breath are properly eliminated. And people who suffer from anxiety, they only breathe from the top half of their lungs. So taking nice deep breaths allows them to breathe in a calmer, more conscious way. But breathing out for twice the length of breathing in allows them to expel all of the waste products that would otherwise stay within our body and affect our thoughts and affect the internal perceptions of our body. So focusing on your breath, focusing on the air passing through the bridge of your nose, focusing on the air going into your lungs, the movement of your diaphragm, the muscles, focusing on breathing out, making sure to breathe out properly, and even extending this and becoming aware of the whole body breathing. The Buddha first taught his students in the great discourse on mindfulness. The number one beginning step was to become aware of the air flowing in and out the nostrils. Then number two, to become aware of the air flowing into the lungs and back out again. And then number three was to become aware of the body breathing. So he built it up step by step with his followers. Air is so important. It's our second being food, breathing in and then breathing out. And breathing out is as important as breathing in. And then let's move and do the 60 bone exercise that we've been talking about. In my hand, there's a bone that goes from in my palm to my knuckle, my first knuckle. So there's one bone here, there's another bone here, and there's another bone here. The very tips of the, the fingers are actually phalanges. They're sort of bone-like, but we actually have you know three bones in the body. Uh, or in the body, in the hand. And this exercise involves becoming aware of all three bones. So I'm not going to say become aware of the three bones in your thumb. When I say, you know, the thumb, there's a phrase, we can bring the holy uh, prayer with it, the holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling transubstantiate in me for my being. And the sequence of this is the thumb, the holy affirming, the index finger, the holy denying, the middle finger, the holy reconciling, and then the fourth finger, transubstantiate in me, and then the baby finger, for my being. And the sequence of this exercise is we start with the right hand, starting with the thumb, then we move down to the left foot, starting with the baby toe, then we move over to the right foot, starting with the big toe, and then we move up to the left hand, starting with the baby toe. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, the importance of learning to distinguish each toe, each finger, to develop the sensation of them. And I've taught this exercise to people, and sometimes I've told them, and I'm not uh, too mobile, is to, you know, if you have problems, hold, touch your toe to differentiate. You know, if you have problems differentiating these two toes, sense them. And it's nice and warm. It's 35 degrees outside. That's why I'm in bare feet and I'm in shorts. Um, I don't, uh, you know, rather than having socks on, in case you're wondering. Um, so we're going to start. 
Well, let's just ground ourselves back in our body, sensing our body, aware of our breathing, aware of the flow of air in and back out again, aware of the body breathing, sensing our body, and then become aware of your right thumb and think the word wholly affirming your right index finger, wholly denying, your right middle finger, wholly reconciling, your right fourth finger, transubstantiate in me, and your right baby finger, for my being, your left baby toe, wholly affirming, your left fourth toe, wholly denying, your left middle toe, wholly reconciling. Your left second toe, transubstantiate in me. Your left big toe, for my being. Your right big toe, wholly affirming. Your right second toe, wholly denying. Your right middle toe, wholly reconciling. Your right fourth toe, transubstantiate in me, and your right baby toe, for my being. And then to come up to your left baby finger, wholly affirming, your left fourth finger, wholly denying, your left middle finger, wholly reconciling, your left index finger, transubstantiate in me, and your left thumb, for my being. And let's do this again. Your right thumb, wholly affirming. Right index finger, wholly denying. Right middle finger, wholly reconciling. Right fourth finger, transubstantiate in me. And your right baby finger, for my being. Your left baby toe, wholly affirming. Left fourth toe, wholly denying. Left middle toe, wholly reconciling. Left second toe, transubstantiate in me. Left big toe, for my being. Right big toe, wholly affirming. Right second toe, wholly denying. Right middle toe, wholly reconciling, right fourth toe, transubstantiate in me, right baby toe, for my being. Coming up to the left hand, the baby finger, wholly affirming, the fourth finger, wholly denying, the middle finger, wholly reconciling, the index finger, transubstantiate in me, and the left thumb, for my being. And let's do this one more time. The right thumb, wholly affirming. The right index finger, wholly denying. The right middle finger, wholly reconciling. The right fourth finger, transubstantiate in me. The right baby finger, for my being. The left baby toe, wholly affirming, the left fourth toe, wholly denying, the left middle toe, wholly reconciling, the left second toe, transubstantiate in me, and the left big toe, for my being, the right big toe, wholly affirming, the right second toe, wholly denying, the right middle toe, wholly reconciling, the right fourth toe, transubstantiate in me, and the right baby toe, for my being. And then coming up and finishing with the left hand, the left baby finger, wholly affirming, the left fourth finger, wholly denying, the left middle finger, wholly reconciling, the left index finger, transubstantiate in me, and the left thumb, for my being. Now, uh, Paul Beidler, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's students, who goes through this exercise, and this is where I learned this exercise from one of his students, says that this is a good exercise to begin our day with, so that when we're still in bed, 
to work through it. We have 15 bones in the hand, 15 bones in, well, we've got 10 bones when we are not 15, we've got 30 bones uh, in our hands, 30 bones in the feet that we're working with. So it's called the 60 bone exercise to try to become aware of these appendages, to try to become aware of the bones. And it is something that we build up and that we practice. So learning how to do this is very important. Now, another thing that Mr. Gurdjieff said uh, is important is whenever we do inner work, what we're really doing is we're collecting our atmosphere around us. And so imagine that you have an atmosphere, and this atmosphere is perhaps a meter, meter and a half. Become aware of the atmosphere surrounding your body. And he said the atmosphere is composed of a number of different components, our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations. And if we think about something far away, part of our atmosphere goes there. And he said, try to keep the atmosphere collected. Try to keep your associations, your thoughts calm. Try to keep your feelings calm. Try to keep your body calm. Try to keep your atmosphere contained in this meter, meter and a half space around your body. Become aware that you have an atmosphere, just like the earth has an atmosphere. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. And when I get to three, just suck it into your body. And as I, with the breathing exercises that we've gone through, imagine something remains. So keep your atmosphere still, keep your atmosphere calm, just keep it tranquil. One, two, three. Suck it in, suck the emanations in, allow the emanations to settle within you to help build, help to create the Kesjan body help to create your higher being body. And breathe out naturally, but imagine something remains within you. And then it's always good to end with an affirmation. It's actually good to begin with an affirmation, which I didn't do. Uh, but the ending affirmation, my favorite one, is just quietly in your mind, say the words, may result from this exercise. be transubstantiated within me. For my being. And then, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff also recommended that when we do inner exercises, we don't go, okay, the exercise is over and then run outside and jump on our bike or whatever. He said it's good to try to remain, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, in a very calm, collected state. And he says that when we do this, the emanations that we created through these exercises have a greater chance to settle and crystallize within us to help us to grow our being. Um, something I wanted to talk about today, I'm just going to pull it up on the screen, is where we fit into nature. And one of the reasons why we are doing this inner work. This is an ancient diagram. Uh, it goes back, I, my belief is it's an antediluvian. In other words, pre-flood. In other words, it goes back to about uh, uh, 12,500 BC. Um, you know, for those who want to get more information on that, uh, you know, Go and watch some of the videos with Graham Hancock, particularly the ones that he does with a man by the name of Randall Carlson, um, talking about the fact that uh, the Earth probably suffered from a massive uh, comet that uh, melted the glaciers in the uh, north and led to flooding and um, the possibility of an advanced civilization that existed on this planet with an advanced knowledge. And when Mr. Gurdjieff was a young boy, um, he came across certain things that he couldn't explain, like Yazidis, um, who they could draw a circle around them and they couldn't step out of the circle, and other phenomenon that he found inexplicable. And then as a, a, a young adolescent, he came to the conclusion that there had once been an immense ancient knowledge 
that had slowly over time been dispersed and forgotten. And he went in search of this ancient knowledge. And initially he went searching for a certain brotherhood. And then he went to Egypt. And then he met people who uh, formed a loose-knit organization called the Seekers of the Truth. And they went and found pieces of this ancient knowledge in various different places. And he ended up with a group that he called the Sarmong Brotherhood or the collectors of honey, um, the beekeepers, and going around and uh, uh, collecting information and uh, preserving some of this knowledge. And I believe that that is where he got this diagram from. I've altered this diagram from the original one, because if you can see where my cursor is right now, circling where it says awake man, in the original diagram, he used the word angels to talk about this level. In this level, he didn't use the word slumbering man, he just used vertebrates. And in this level, he didn't use the word mindful man, he just used man. Because at this corner, at this level, this is where man should rightfully be. We should rightfully live in a natural state of mindful awareness but we don't. It's like we've fallen down into a very mechanical state where we lack this mindful awareness, where we are little more than machines. But this diagram shows that there is a thrust to evolution. Evolution, the development of species may be, you know, guided by chance, so to speak, you know, the, the combinations of DNA and which one works and which one doesn't but it's all based on the concept of feeding and being fed. Uh, modern day biologists understand this. They say that, you know, when species go extinct and there's lots of food around, other species evolve to eat that food. And according to Mr. Gurdjieff in this ancient understanding, the purpose of our life is to transform energy. And energy is an abstract term, and we transform energy in the form of food, and we eat three foods. The food that we eat, the air that we breathe, and the impressions that we receive. So all life is really a chain of transformations, getting more and more and more refined as it goes up. So according to this diagram, life starts with the metals. And then out of the metals arise the minerals. Then out of the minerals arise the plants. Then out of the plants arise the invertebrates. And out of the invertebrates arise the vertebrates. Now, it's important to realize that even though these look like discrete, separate categories, they're really continuum. So in terms of vertebrates, we can put mammals at the top. And in terms of mammals, we can put humans at the top. But vertebrates, vertebrates means a spinal column. So all animals who have a spinal column transform a fairly refined energy. But humanity at its lowest level, when we are machines, when we lack that self-reflectivity, when we lack that mindful awareness, are little more than animals. In uh, Beelzebub Tales, to his grandson, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff's major work, he talks about a device that they measured the vibration of the transformation, or, or I forget the words that he used of sheep and goats, and how they were almost identical to certain human beings. So when we exist in the slumbering state, when we're caught up in our thoughts and we're not mindful and we're in that state of mindlessness, we are really just transforming the same level of energy, being of the same level of service to this planet as other animals, as other vertebrates are. But the interesting thing about man is that we have the potential to transform energy across three uh, Bennett called them essence classes. I prefer to think of them as food classes because it makes more sense. These are food classes. So humans have the potential to transform energy across 
three classes. So normally we get up and we're in our mind and our mind is worrying, what's this? And we're not really present in the moment. We're not really aware in the moment. So we're transforming one level of energy. But as we begin to become mindful, as we sense our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, as we become aware of the touch of air on our skin, the clothing on our body, as we become aware of the sensation of air flowing into our lungs and back out again, as we begin to become aware of what we can see, the perceptions, the mindful perception of what comes into our eyes, the mindful perceptions of the sounds coming into our ears, the smells coming into our nose, the taste in our mouth, we are actually stepping up one level into the realm of mindful man. And in doing so, we are actually serving a higher purpose. So if you want to serve a higher purpose on this sacred planet, the way to do that is to transform a higher energy. So by becoming mindful, all of these exercises, the 60 bone exercises, learning to distinguish on your right foot the difference between your middle toe and your fourth toe, we're actually part of this immense tapestry of energies being refined up and energies are also coarsened it's like this immense weave that we are involved in but we are moving ourselves up ever so slightly and serving a higher purpose now as i said energies are always going up and they're coming down for instance we eat an apple and part of the energy of the apple is transformed up Part of it is transformed down and we flush it away in the toilet bowl. And, you know, if we were in the forest, in the woods, we would go off into the woods and it would become food for lower beings, everything. Our in-breath is the out-breath of plants that have chlorophyll, you know, like leaves, green plants. Our out-breath is the food for those same beings, for leaves and grass and trees and plants. So there's this constant reciprocity of energy. And uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that the ancients had a formula in terms of a phrase, I eat so I can be eaten. Every day or every second, millions of skin cells are flaking off our body. And we can't see them, but in our houses, in our apartments, filled with dust mites who are feeding on them. There's this constant feeding. It's been estimated if we never got rid of anything in our body and built it up, by the time we died, we would be like 55 million tons. There's this constant reciprocity occurring through the process of eating and being eaten. My exhaling the waste products is food for other beings, and they provide food for me, and there's this whole movement up and this movement down, this immense tapestry. At the next level up is the level of awakened man. In the original diagram that Mr. Gurdjieff gave uh, 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 P.D. Uspensky sometime around 1916-17, he used the word angels for this category. And in a way, if you reflect on it, if you think about this as being the level of an awake man, and the level of angels. It means that someone who has awoken in the metaphysical sense, in the sense of conscious awareness, is, so to speak, on the level of angels. But we are creating this, this movement upwards that then, according, now I go back to the old diagram, archangels, the eternal unchanging, the absolute. We can, we can put different terms in this. We can talk about the top one, number one, being the holy affirming. We can talk about number six, being the holy denying. And then number three, being the holy reconciling. Within the law of three, the higher, which in this is the absolute, blends with the lower. Here we've got archangels, but it could be the holy denying to meet in the middle, which is the holy reconciling. So we can look at these three 
last ones, as elements of the Godhead, as elements of a more divine level. And this takes us into esoteric Christianity, where they say that man, our purpose is to become a link between heaven and earth. And we can see through this diagram, it's really only when a person becomes awake, when they awaken to the potential, when they develop the real eye, that they are able to be this conduit between heaven and earth. Now, it's not that if you're an awake man, you live solely in this category, because you have this category, this category, this category, this category, this category, all of them, uh, you have a metal self. You have a mineral self. You have a vegetative or a plant self. You have an invertebrate self. You have a vertebrate self. You have a mindful self. You would have an awake self. It's like, you know, the, the, the metals are the, the, a, 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 a one-story house, and then they build a second story on it, the minerals. And then a third story, the plants. And then a fourth story, the invertebrates. And so on, building up these levels. So that within myself, my physical body is composed of the elements of the earth and actually even the elements slightly lower than the metals. So by transforming as high an energy as I can within myself, I am becoming this link between heaven and earth. But rather than metaphorically describing it as they do in versions of esoteric Christianity, these are the ancient diagrams. This is the ancient science of transformation. And there's an alchemical process to this. The higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. So uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that uh, um, organic life on planet Earth is the evolving part of planet Earth. And within the evolving part of planet Earth, humanity is the evolving part of organic life. And within humanity, there's a section of humanity that's the evolving part of humanity. And if that part stops evolving, it will have a sort of a backflow and ramifications to organic life, to this planet. And therefore, it's important for some of us, not all of us, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said quality rather than quantity, for some of us to really work on ourselves, to strive to do what we can to awaken, to provide these links, to, to help Earth. So the higher the energy we transform, the higher the service we give to this planet. And we are connected through this chain. It's all within us, all of these different levels, and everything, excuse me, is within us. Um, I'm going to bring up another diagram that I've shown a lot. Um, this is the human journey. The numbers, 1, 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, they're all the same as the numbers on the other diagram. They all represent the same thing. And the square on the left, Mr. Gurdjieff said, you know, it's like we're three-story beings in the center of gravity of our psychic life. If you're a mechanical sleeping man, is world 48. You transform a very mechanical energy. You can peek up to the states of mindful awareness, and you can go down to very dark, reactive, negative, emotional states. Mindful man, you're actually moving the center of gravity of your psychic life up into the level of mindful awareness. And this means you have access to conscious energy. And at the lowest level, you can still be very mechanical. You can still fall into those states of sleep, but you're no longer trapped and pulled down by the homicidal rage, the road rage, those real dark emotions that are at the lower story of most people. And then as you step up to conscious man, you move up to the level of conscious energy, up to the angelic level, but you also have access 
to the lowest level of the Godhead, to the holy denying. And at your lowest level, you can still be in the very, the, the, the mindful level can be very emotionally reactive where you love and you hate. It can be like a pendulum swinging across. And so, you know, people who are awake can exhibit what to other people appear um, lower order phenomenons, but it's because we are beings that are, exist on multiple levels. And these, are, these squares just represent the center of gravity of our psychic life. Because as I said, you know, I have a metal self, I have a mineral self, I have a plant vegetative self, I have an invertebrate self. These are all composed within me. So uh, I have access to those different levels of consciousness. And unlike some people who claim, you know, I'm awake and I'm, yeah, I'm awake. Are you awake? Mr. Gurdjieff said that an awakened man passes through the lower states. So he passes through the mindful state, he even passes into the mechanical state. And he has access to the four states of consciousness, which are sleep. And then over here in the left, waking sleep, personal consciousness, and objective consciousness. And he passes through all of them. Mr. Gurdjieff said that when he wanted to go to sleep and he was speaking about the state of waking sleep, he would go to the cinema and get lost in the pictures and images on the screen. And he said that when he engaged in business and he appraised antiques and he did various things, he would only be half awake. Um, so people who say they're always awake and fully awake, I begin to suspect it because it doesn't conform to what I understand about these teachings. Um, now I'm going to go to uh, the real focus that I wanted to talk today. Um, let me just bring it up. And this is something I've mentioned before. Um, this is page, let me go to the top, 1167 of Beelzebub Tales to His Grandson. It's the chapter called Form and Sequence. It's one of the most important chapters in that book. Because when we grow our Kesjian body, when we build our higher body, which in the previous um, image would have been the center uh, of it, not the right side, which is the awakened, it's the development of the mindful awareness. When we grow our Kesjian body, we actually have to grow it in the proper form and sequence. Um, and I've said that, Mr. Gurdjieff, in this section very clearly, but unless you understand what he's talking about, you don't, you can't pick it up. But he very clearly explains the process of self remembering here. So, although in respect of the sacred triamazicamno, triam which is the law of three, so although in respect of the sacred law of three, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, the process of the arising of both kinds of being reason flows equally. Yet the fulfilling factors for the actualization of its three separate holy forces are different. Holy forces, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Namely, for the formation of the reason of knowing, the formerly perceived contradictory impressions crystallized in any one of the three localizations, head brain, body brain, and feeling brain, which the three brain beings have, serve as the affirming and denying factors, and the new impressions proceeding from without serve in this case as the third factor. So what he's saying is that when we are in a state of mindlessness, when we are not engaging in self-remembering in the proper way, our head brain, you know, we can, words can come up, memories, whatever, our body brain, it's all really confused and jumbled around. And what we perceive, the receiving of impressions goes to the wrong place. And for the reason of understanding, this is self-remembering, these factors are as follows. 
first. That is the sacred affirming. Think head brain. Is the newly perceived impressions of any localization which has at the given moment what is called the center of gravity of functioning. So you see something and you become mindfully aware of it or you become mindfully aware of something you hear or smell or taste. The second or the sacred denying. This is our body brain. This is the act of self-sensing. Is the corresponding data present in another of his localizations? And the third factor is what is called being autocolizitners, or as they are otherwise called. I love this. You know, Mr. Gurdjieff in these words called it who does bag go ganeri, um, the sense of which name signifies the results of the persevering actualizing of the striving towards the manifestation of one's own individuality. That's a fancy way of saying to begin to wake up. Um, we never receive linguistic impressions for the first time. This whole book is designed to give you these linguistic impressions for the first time and force you to confront it, force you to dig deeper and deeper into the understanding. Because only when we do the, the effort can we claim that we can own this knowledge, but deconstructing this. Um, so the sacred affirming is our head brain. The sacred denying is our body brain. And the way we prevent the first thing from happening, which is the mindless state where we're not really present and we're not crystallizing and growing ourselves in the proper form and sequence is the second or the sacred denying to this is the sensing of the self. This is why it is so important to develop this sensation of self, why it's so important to get so good at it that we can hold it in the back of our awareness. It was about seven or eight years ago that I discovered that I could actually talk and maintain this awareness of my physical body at the same time. Before, whenever I talked, I would lose this awareness. I would become the words I was speaking. Uh, so it required, for me, it took years and years and years, but then I had to slowly figure these things out. Um, hopefully, people who are listening to this can cut their journey down by a half or even a third to realize that the way we receive impressions properly is through being able to hold this awareness of our physical body in the background of our awareness. As I said, this can never be an automatic or mechanical awareness. It requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of building up. But when we can hold the sensation of self in the correct position, in the second position, and we receive impressions from the outside in the correct position, in the first position. It's like our head becomes the positive end of a battery and our body becomes the negative end of a battery, the wholly affirming, wholly denying. And the current between these two creates a special substance that crystallizes in the proper form and sequence within us. And here he called them being autocolonitic. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Um, this is, these are the substances he's talking about. This is the alchemical transformation that then begins to grow our Kesjian body. Now, I'm just going to try and quickly go to the very end of this chapter. Let me see if I can do it. I don't want to go too far beyond. Um, the end of this chapter, um, he's talking about active mentation. This is something that he's used before, a phrase, active being mentation. Self-remembering, being conscious of what I see, hear, smell, taste, 
while being aware of my physical body, while developing the sensation of self, creates a substance in me that goes and it crystallizes in a proper way to create the Kesjian body. This actually has a twin. No one talks about the fact that our active being mentation or active mentation is the twin of self-remembering and it does the same. So the very last paragraph, I find it necessary to repeat that the active mentation in a being and the useful results of such active mentation are in reality actualized exclusively only with the equal degree functionings of all his three localizations of the results spiritualized in his presence called thinking center, feeling center, moving center. And here um, he talked about the you know, lawful inexactitude. I would phrase this thinking center, moving motor center, and feeling center, the holy affirming up in our head, the holy denying in our body, and the holy reconciling, what grows between the higher blending with the lower in terms of our feeling. So the proper form and sequence of these events are important. So I'm just going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, one of the, the other diagram. Um, this entire thing that I've been talking about from that chapter, those paragraphs is represented in this middle diagram. This middle diagram is personal consciousness. It's the first conscious shock. And Mr. Gurdjieff says the first conscious shock occurs within Do 48 of the octave of impressions. And he defines this shock as, for instance, the eyes becoming aware, becoming aware within my eyes, sensing my eyes and becoming aware of the light flowing into my eyes. Um, Beidler used the word uh, global. It's the global visual awareness of what is coming into my eyes. It's not focusing on one thing or whatever. It's trying to develop a visual gestalt, an impartiality, but the awareness of my eyes receiving all of this light, the awareness of my ears receiving sound, the awareness of my nose smelling, the awareness of my taste buds tasting. So what happens is if we go over to the, the left diagram, a normal sleeping human being, they just mechanically receive impressions. Your eyes are always receiving impressions. Your ears, even when you're sleeping, your ears are receiving impressions. This is why if someone calls your name or screams, you wake up because there's a part that's always listening, but it's a very mechanical part. So normally the impressions we receive because we do it with such lack of awareness, we do it mindlessly, have no real power. Uh, J.G. Bennett says that the, the energy that comes in through our eyes, because our eyes do transform the light into electrical signals, our ears transform it into electrical signals. This is the energy of hydrogen 48. He says the body can directly feed off this energy and it doesn't need to transform it. So this is the picture of the normal human being in that level of waking sleep where they are a little different from mammals and from other animals. When we begin to become aware of things, you know, coming into our eyes and our eyes receiving the light and that global awareness and our ears receiving sound and the global awareness of the sound coming in, we actually give Do 48 the sufficient energy that it needs to begin to transform up to Ray 24 and up to Me 12. Now, with the law of octave, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, Do, 
between me and fa. There is an actual slowing down of the vibrations, a retarding of the vibrations, and an outside shock is necessary. If we go to the very left diagram, the octave of food is the part of the body that naturally produces, and it produces the highest energy the body can produce, C12, and I've talked about this in uh, 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 other talks. Um, and this gets stolen by other energies through negative emotions, identification, and whatever. But me, 192, would not develop up to the next step if it wasn't for air. And Mr. Gurdjieff called this nature's mechanical shock. So the DO48 has the sufficient energy, it's at the right valence that allows the octave of food to develop. But the impressions we receive don't have the same effect on the me of the octave of air and prevents it from developing properly. So when we become conscious of receiving impressions, we receive them in the right place. This gives... Uh, me 48 of the octave of air, sufficient energy to move all the way up to so 12 and possibly la 6. And this can set in a sequence of events. Now I've got the complete diagram, the final product diagram of the first conscious shock. For some cases, it, it we have to build it up step by step. We've got to slowly develop and enhance our ability to do this. But the conscious, or not necessarily conscious, but the mindful awareness of our feelings, to be mindful of what we are feeling right now, is a result of FA24. We can locate it as a specific molecule. The mindful awareness of what we see, hear, smell, taste, the impressions coming in through our head is fueled by ray 24 and the mindful sensation of ourself the sensation of our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head is fueled by la 24 so these three molecules la 24 of the octave of food which is the body brain fa 24 of the octave of air which is the feeling brain and ray 24 of the octave of impressions, which is the head brain, together, when done in the proper form and sequence with the right energy, is what full self remembering is. But again, we've got to remember the sequence. The head brain is the active, it's the sacred affirming, it's the active. The body brain is the passive. It is the, the sacred denying and the feeling brain, excuse me, is the reconciling aspect. And we have to receive the new impressions in the affirming, in the active position. So to become aware of what we can see, hear, smell, taste at the level of mindful awareness while sensing the physical body and then becoming aware of our feelings and the feeling that grows between them is the proper form and sequence for doing this. Now, as I said, self-remembering has a twin. So the first conscious shock doesn't necessarily have to involve becoming aware of what we see, hear, smell, and taste. If we are mindfully aware of what we are thinking, and we do this through holding the sensation of our self. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff described this um, particularly in the Herald of Coming Good, how he would go into himself, hold all of this together, maintain that awareness of our, his, his body while he thought through a problem. Um, so active being mentation and self-remembering have an equivalence. They are connected. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. I've gone through a lot today, um, and I've gone through some of this before, but building up our understanding of what we are trying to do. We are trying to grow our being. We are trying to transform our being, to transform higher 
and higher energies. And J.G. Bennett said that in every, say, let's say, a, a specific act of mindfulness, one third of the energy is consumed by the process itself. One third of the energy is returned to ourselves, sort of as a gift from great nature so that we can grow our being. And then one third of the energy is used by great nature. So whenever we begin to work on ourselves, whenever we begin to transform higher energies, we are growing our being, the third that comes back to ourself, particularly if we learn to do this in the proper form form and sequence. We are growing our being, but one third is being used by great nature. One third of what we are doing is fueling organic life, this planet, who knows what. But what it means is that every time we engage in mindful awareness, every time we engage in proper spiritual practices, not only are we nurturing ourselves but we are doing something that is very important for this planet. Mr. Gurdjieff was aware of the coming, you know, catastrophe that our planet was facing. You know, he said that there was a wave that was going to swamp humanity, and he saw it in America first because it was the dominance of the head brain and the forgetting of the body and the feeling brain, and it came through mass media and the rise of mass media and various different things. And so there's a lowering, a coarsening of humanity as we become more and more thinking creatures divorced from our body, divorced from our feelings. But every spiritual act, every time we begin and try to step up, we are serving a higher purpose. We are serving great nature. We are becoming these links, these conduits between heaven and earth. So every act, every time I try to develop myself, every time I try to evolve, there are cosmic significances to what I'm doing that extend beyond myself. And Mr. Gurdjieff was aware of the coming catastrophe. It's in his writings. You can read it. Um, if you want, if you, you know that passage from Tales, you realize how hard it is to figure it out, but it's all there, particularly in tales. And what he said was, quality now is needed. Quality is more important than quantity. And what he was really saying by that phrase is that we do not need, and there will not be, a mass awakening of humanity. We just need a sufficient quantity, not a massive amount of people to awaken. The way I visualize it is like a pyramid. So it, it narrows at the top. We need sleeping people. We need mindful people. And then we need a much smaller level of conscious people. And the problem isn't at the lower level. It's not at the mechanical end. It's at the higher level. We don't have enough individuals right now in this planet who are really truly striving to awaken. A lot of people in the spiritual community and the so-called conscious community, they think they've escaped from the matrix, but they've really just gone down another rabbit hole. And part of the reason is they don't understand this ancient science. They don't understand how it all fits together. And so they just get caught up in their illusions that they're being conscious and they're doing all of these things. Um, for me, I think this ancient science, this ancient understanding is so important. At any rate, I've talked a lot. <laughs> uh, any questions? Any comments? Um, I was noticing in the, the Alchemy of Human Transformation diagram that you've, you've shown today and, and previously that um, especially what you said with the yeah, let me have it. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. The the um, the sort of gap between me and Fa. Yeah. Um, I noticed there's. It seems like in 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 you know under waking sleep. 
in the in the food octave you've got do re mi and then at you know the level of 192 with me you've got air coming in as the first shock yeah and then in under personal consciousness you've got do re mi of the air octave and then you've got do of the impressions coming in yeah the first shock yeah so under objective consciousness you've also got do re mi of the impressions and okay. if the I, pattern continues there should be a do of another center yeah, or something yeah, yeah. But, um you know i don't want to go into this in too great a detail but the monastic life um does a hack they work with c12 and i've talked about this i think in the last uh a meeting where they hack into this through going to a monastery, leaving their societies and whatever. And he says that for this level, the proper transformation has to begin with me 12, not C 12, but somehow. So 12 adds some kind of an effect to me 12, which then creates the resonant effect for C 12 for all of these things to move up to the next level. And Mr. Gurdjieff said that the second conscious shock, and he didn't talk about it a lot. So within the Gurdjieffian community, there's this real interest in discovering what the second conscious shock is. But he gave us one hint, uh, or he gave P.D. Uspensky in Search of the Miraculous. He said it somehow involves the transformation of our emotions. In other words, the second conscious shock is somehow triggered with so 12 of the octave of error, of our feelings, and that this somehow has the effect on the me 12, which has the effect on the C12, which allows them to move up. Um, but this is one of those $64,000 questions within the Gurdjieffian community, what is it? How do we transform our emotions? How do we grow our emotions? And uh, as a hypnotherapist, actually, this is something that I do with people, figuring out where our emotions are broken. Usually I just try to help people create a certain degree of balance in their emotions so that they're not stuck in depression, that they have ac excuse me, access to happiness as well. But there's a higher level of emotion. And it's Mr. Gurdjieff didn't really talk about that top end. And there are people who are followers of PDU Spensky who said, you know, Spensky said the system's incomplete. Mr. Gurdjieff didn't give us the final pieces and perhaps he didn't know them. I don't believe that whatsoever. Mr. Gurdjieff, it's true, didn't give the final pieces, but I certainly believe he knew them. But, you know, if he gave, the, if he talked about the high stuff, if he talked about that, People get too focused on that. The next step, the step up immediately from where you are is more important than what happens five steps up from where you are. And a lot of spiritual teachings, a lot of people talk about that higher connection. They talk about the lower connections, the immediate steps that we take. But it is the transformation of emotions. It's part of it involves becoming conscious and mindful of our emotions. So tapping into that uh, law, not law 24, do re mi, fa 24 of the octave of air. The beginning of it involves just becoming mindful of your emotions. You know, what am I feeling right now? Am I feeling happy? Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling depressed? Am I feeling fearful? Am I feeling neutral? bringing that mindful awareness to our feelings that then allow the octave of feelings to develop up to the next level. Uh, so 12 is the mindful energy. Um, so I, that's, that's not an explanation, but it's a partial explanation. Um, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll really think about this, maybe not the next uh, uh, meeting, but I will try and delve into this, explain it a little bit more. Um, but we can experience this, and we have experienced this. And it's a way to open ourselves. Um, we can go back, if, if you go, um, I'm just about running out of time. Um, if you go back to this diagram, um, for instance, and start connecting it to what Mr. Gurdjieff 
uh, talked about to Peter Uspensky, that's in chapter nine of In Search of the Miraculous. He said the intellectual center operates with hydrogen 48. So it's this dough 48. He said the higher emotional center operates from hydrogen 12. So the higher emotional center operates with Ba 24. We can locate the moving center, all of those energies that he was talking about in this diagram. But somehow so 12 is different. And I really should do a talk on the difference between 12, 24, and 48. But uh, just briefly, in order to become mindful of your hands, in order to sense your hands as fully and as mindfully as you can, a little bit of C12 is necessary. You may not be aware of that higher energy, but that higher energy is present. In order to sense my body, that C12 is necessary. In order to become aware of what I can see, hear, smell, taste, that C12 is necessary. Or see, hear, smell, taste, the me 12 is necessary. So in all acts of self-remembering, in all dimensions of self-remembering, conscious energy is present. But it's like my hand right now. It's behind my head. I can't see it. But my hand is there. So in every act of mindful awareness, every... Uh, movement up into the first conscious shock involves this higher energy as the higher blending with the lower to meet in the middle. And we can talk about certain qualities of this higher energy, but uh, that will be for another meeting because uh, um, we've run out of time. Anything quickly before we go? Um, uh, not something that I think we'd have the time to get into, but I, I have been interested in, in conscience. Conscience. And how that yeah, how that yeah. fits into a lot of the things we've, we've talked about. And I know yeah. that's conscious is a whole big thing, but I just want to put yeah, that Well, out. I mean, I can, you know, uh, very, very quickly, um, going back to this diagram here, so 12 is ah. conscious. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, me 12 is consciousness, so 12 is conscience, and C12 is being. Um, so the octave of air at the level of hydrogen 12, in other words, the emotional center at the level of hydrogen 12 is conscience. That's where it fits in. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I talk about those things and everything, I'll, I'll have to think about it, you know, make sure that I got my thoughts all collected and talk about it. Maybe not in the next one, maybe in the next one, I'll have to see. Um, but, uh, at any rate, okay. I'll Just stop sharing. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so conscience is a uh, hydrogen 12 phenomenon and gotcha. it's part of the real eye. And uh, so, you know, when you wake into the real eye, your conscience is there. It should be. At any rate, thank you for all coming. Um, it's noon now here in Toronto and beautiful weather. And it's smoky in Portland, Oregon, because of all those fires in California. Do you have fires in Oregon going on right now? Uh, not nearby, no. Uh, but, it's mainly Northern California is just blowing up. Yeah, but you must have some beautiful sunsets. <laughs> we do. <laughs> with all the smoke in the air. Um, and uh, hopefully it's beautiful down in Colombia and South America, Guido. Um, so thank you all for coming and uh, take care. Bye now. Bye.